So we have talked a lot in this class about a lot of things leading to this chapter, how we approach our work. We've talked about culture and communication, uh, working in multicultural settings. We talked about oppression, power dynamics, and uh, social justice. We've also talked about having schema for work. And uh, we talked a little bit about what our brain does in the interpreting process. And so in this chapter, in chapter eight, how we approach our work, we're going to discuss the philosophy of the role of the interpreter. We know that as an interpreter, we're facilitating communication and interpreting the language from one, one source language to the target language. But what is the role of the interpreter? What other responsibilities does the interpreter have in relaying that information? Because we know that it's not a word-for-word -word translation or a word-for-word -word transmission of information. We know that it's so much more than that. And we also know that as situations arise, communication is not the only thing happening uh, in the world of or in the work of interpreting. There's other things that happen. There's people asking questions, there's people not understanding, there's setting up our place, our position, um, etc. There's sometimes when an interpreter is asked to participate, how do, what does that mean and how do we get out of that? How do we politely not intrude or how do we um, kind of manage those situations where we know that the situation is not about us, but by nature of, it, of another person in the situation, we are a third party now involved that we can't be ignored. So how do we navigate that kind of sticky uh, situation? And that's what we're going to talk about in chapter eight. So in this chapter, your book calls it the philosophical frame that defines the approach to the task of interpreting. Also called, out in the field, we call it the models of interpreting. Um, so you may, although your book refers to it as the philosophy of, you may hear interpreters discuss it as an interpreting model. Uh, and so I use both words interchangeably throughout the lecture. And so what is that? What is a philosophical frame or interpreting model? Um, what it is, is it is the philosophy we follow that determines the way the interpreter views their clients, the way the interpreter views their role, uh, the client's roles, and how they view themselves and the role of the interpreter. And the way you view the role uh, will determine the way you act and determine what kind of responsibility or sense of responsibility you feel you may have in any given situation. The philosophy and ideology that the interpreter follows also determines their view of ASL English and their view of deaf and hearing norms and rules of interaction. And it also heavily influences the tenets of the professional code of conduct. Uh, now remember, your book calls it the code of ethics because RID initially set it up and called it as the code of ethics, but it was later updated and revised, and we now call it the CPC, the Code of Professional Conduct. So you may have seen me or heard me say in other lectures the CPC, I'm referring to Code of Professional Conduct, where your book may still use the term Code of Ethics. And so the philosophy of the philosophical frame or the interpreting model gives the interpreter uh, their interpretation of how to apply the CPC and how to use the power 
that is inherent in the position of the interpreter. We have discussed oppression and power dynamics. We have discussed the fact that the interpreter is the one person in the room who understands both cultures and both languages. And so in that alone, that's full of power um, uh, that an interpreter has in managing the communication flow, in uh, choosing to drop information or not drop information, even in accepting an assignment that perhaps they should not have accepted. There's power in that that the interpreter has exerted by doing things like that. And so the names of those, those philosophical frames are, uh, as they're listed on your PowerPoint, the helper philosophy, the conduit or machine philosophy, language facilitation, and the bilingual bicultural, which is typically called the bye-bye model. So remember that in our discussion, the profession of interpreting is fairly new, right? Uh, your book mentions that RID is established in 1964 or thereabout. And so that's only the beginning. That's the beginning of the recognition of interpreters as professionals. And because of that, because historically interpreters were uh, people doing favors or people who, who wanted to, to be of service to the deaf community, but there was no real understanding of, hey, this is a, a skill set that should be paid or a, a profession or even the ADA law that says an entity or institution is required to provide an interpreter service and thereby pay for it. Because there isn't any of that, and because of the way people fell into interpreting, and again, giving their time, deaf people were generally viewed as handicapped, limited, and unable to fully manage their personal and business affairs. And so it fell on to the interpreter to be uh, some kind of caretaker. And it still happens today where sometimes I arrive to uh, an assignment and, and because people aren't as exposed to sign language interpreters, I mean, we start, we see them more. Of course, you all have seen them in your classes and on television and, and maybe at other, other locations you've been to, but there still is um, a lot of lack of understanding. And so, as we'll talk about here, uh, part of the interpreter's role is to educate and it still happens today that I may arrive to an assignment and somebody says, did you drive together? Or do you know if that person is coming? Or do you know X, Y, and Z personal information about the deaf consumer? And of course I don't. I'm, I'm a separate person. I'm a professional hired many times by, by the very agency who's asking me these personal questions about the deaf consumer. And but there's a confusion or, or lack of understanding because people still view the interpreter as the helper. But because it's really important as a profession and in our code of conduct, we are still trying to show ourselves as professionals and to show that we do have a professional boundary. And because of that, you may see that interpreters go out of their way to not be viewed as the helper because we're not just trying to follow a certain interpreting model or philosophy we're also trying to continue to uh, propagate or continue to push forward the field of professional sign language interpreters so the reasons that we don't want to be viewed as helpers are twofold are not just because of the philosophy that we're following. And also remember, part of this, if we think back to deaf culture and to, to what we've talked about, power dynamics and oppression, uh, 
we're, we're wanting the deaf community to, to find that self-determination. And so by us being in the helper philosophy, we're just kind of impeding that. We're, we're putting up a barrier uh, for them to reach self-determination by doing that. And so um, it's two, twofold, as I said, that we're, we're trying to not only uh, do right by the deaf community, but also do right by our, our colleagues and our profession, because we're trying to show that we are, in fact, uh, professionals. Let me go to the next slide. And so what in the old days, and, and again, you may still find some people who, who are leaning into this helper philosophy, but this is no longer, this is no longer acceptable or no longer a philosophy that's standardized. So somebody, an interpreter operating under this philosophy may step out of their role and advise, teach, or persuade. And so remember that your role as an interpreter is to facilitate communication, not to advise, not to interject your opinion, not to teach, not to convince, not to counsel, not to participate in any way in any given situation. And so even though you might know the answer, you have to think to yourself, wait a minute, an example, if you're interpreting a classroom setting, you have taken English 100 already, and now you're interpreting it, and now this is the third time you interpret it, and you know the answer. But is it your job to give the answer? Because you have to ask yourself, am I the teacher or are they the teacher? Am I the student? Do I get to participate? Am I a student or are they the student? And so asking yourselves, what is my role here? should bring you back to center to remind you not to participate and not to counsel, not to add your opinion or to teach or to persuade, et cetera, as, and all those possibilities that your book lists. And going back to the PowerPoint, the second bullet, the attitude behind the behavior is often the belief that deaf people are incapable of fully understanding or participating in the world around them. Now remember, if you're operating under the helper philosophy, then you really have to ask yourself, why do I feel like I need to help this deaf person? Does that mean you believe that they cannot do it on their own? You really have to ask yourself, then what is my reason for wanting to be an interpreter? As we have already discussed, what is our reason for being here? Do I believe that a deaf person could be fully uh, self-determined and independent? Or do I believe that I need to be there to help? And as um, a student mentioned uh, in their presentation, do I believe that I'm here to remove a language barrier? Or am I here to help? So that is actually really a great idea is to develop what your answer is as to why you're an interpreter. And so as we see in the third bullet, the RID Code of Ethics, which again now called CPC, the Code of Professional Conduct, it was developed partially in a response to the helpers in the field. And I want to remind you that um, we still see these. I still see these helpers in the field. And um, it actually is disheartening. And uh, a lot of times um, people talk bad about those interpreters. Uh, very few people will tell them directly, why are you doing this? Because this is not the way that we operate. And so it really is an incorrect way to go about um, following an interpreter model. And so your work now is to look at your book and to read the helper philosophy in action. Read that situation uh, as it's described and answer um, 
was that the correct approach to the information learned prior to the interpreter assignment? Look at the information in, in the description where it, it tells about what happened in the waiting room. What, what would have been the better use for that information for the interpreter? And then for the second question, what are a few things that could have been done differently in this scenario? And so for the next model, uh, the machine or conduit philosophy, or we call it the conduit model. So if we think about it, the helper model was really the interpreter acting kind of like an aid or um, doing much more than just the task of interpreting language and information. And it was one extreme. And with the realization that this was inappropriate and also oppressive, the field swung to a whole other extreme in a whole other direction, which was to go the complete opposite and follow the machine or conduit philosophy. And what that conduit model was an attempt to have no influence on the dynamics of communication taking place. And what that means is that the interpreter was just relaying information, not really considering anything else that might arise during any given situation. It was not their job to do anything else other than to relay information. But it also meant that the interpreter view the CPC as a rigid set of rules instead of the way we view it today, which is a guideline. And um, the way we view the CPC is we apply it to any given situation, uh, but we take into consideration the dynamics of the situation. There is no black and white. There is always a gray area. And so for that reason, the CPC is really a strong foundational guideline of how we should approach our work. And so the machine uh, conduit philosophy really denied that presence of a third person in the room. By nature, by the simple fact that there is an interpreter present in the room, the dynamics of the conversation have shifted. And because the conversation is happening through an interpretation, by nature, it has an influence on any given situation. But the machine model completely ignored that and assumed we're taking information in, putting it out, input, output, input, output. And it just kind of assumes that it's correct. That's all we need. And so the interpreter following this model is not really aware of the inequities we have discussed. Uh, the deaf experience and uh, the experience and historical oppression of deaf people in the deaf community and, and their response or reaction to that and the continued view of deaf people and the continued oppression of the deaf community. And so oppression still happens, it just happens in a different way. But an interpreter following this machine conduit philosophy is really completely ignoring that not really taking into consideration how that influences communication and the exchange of information in any given setting. And so following this model, the interpreters were more concerned with signing words than signing for meaning, intention, and tone. So what happens if you just sign words and just kind of throw it out there? Does somebody really understand what you're saying? If you're just signing words, it's kind of like just, if I just said words to you and I didn't have my outline, or I didn't pace my, my speech, or I didn't stop and ask you a question, if I just threw words at you, you probably wouldn't understand what I'm saying or what I even mean. Um, and so consider the same thing now through the added layer of interpreted words, somebody else's words that you're not getting directly from source language. That's confusing. That can be overwhelming also.
And so unfortunately, it was very difficult to get any meaning out of it. And it's, it's if you flip the interpretation conversely, if you si said one word for every word signed, would a hearing person understand what people don't sign in English order? And there isn't a direct word for word translation for every sign specifically. And a specific sign can mean something different in context. So if you're just spitting words out to the hearing person, they would equally be confused. So unfortunately, following the machine uh, conduit philosophy, it was very difficult to derive any meaning from these interpretations. But the interpreters took almost like a robot role in the communication process, assuming no responsibility for any interaction, communication dynamics, or anything taking place. They showed up, did their job, out. And so that's very difficult because if we consider uh, what we've been discussing, not just uh, the oppression uh, experienced in the deaf community, but the power that the interpreter holds, but also the knowledge. Remember that I have said the interpreter is the one person in the room that understands both cultures. I'm putting hearing person here, deaf person here. Understands both cultures, understands both languages, and can navigate through both. And it's the interpreter also who understands resources understands how to figure out and pass on those resources, but also is a person who has the most knowledge of the deaf experience. And so when, when, when some information come across, it's the interpreter who can catch it and understand what's happening. And so really what we have to consider is the true resource and fountain of information that the interpreter can be without stepping out of their role in any given situation. And so for the machine conduit philosophy in action, read that scenario in your book and answer the following. What opportunity, and we've mentioned it before in the lectures, did the interpreter miss here? And when the interpreter responds to the question asked of the interpreter, how might the interpreter's response in this scenario affect the rest of that appointment for the deaf person? How might it affect that deaf person's experience now? And what do you think would be a good approach if you were asked that question? How would you how would you navigate? And I'm trying not to give away the question because I'm encouraging you to read the scenario in the book. So then we come to communication facilitation philosophy. And in the early 1970s, there was yet another shift. So the ethical decision-making part was not significantly different. We're still looking at it as kind of a rigid code and not, not really any change there. But the interpreters became more aware of their placement, their lighting, their background, and they began to indicate who was speaking. So imagine what I mean by that is body shift, but also in a classroom setting, uh, and I keep mentioning a classroom setting because in my mind, I feel like that's what you can envision. But you can think of the same thing, presentation, large auditorium, etc. Or we know that uh, the deaf consumer tends to sit with the ability to have the interpreter and the speaker within the line of sight. So what happens if someone in the back of the room asks a question? Typically, the deaf person wants to know, who, who asked? And they look, and then they look again at the interpreter because that puts information into context. Did the student who's always got the great questions ask that question? The student who 
who is always doing really solid work? That's a good question then. I might want to write that down. Or did the student who never shows up and is kind of like flippant about coursework ask that question? Then maybe I'm not going to pay attention. Those are extreme situations, but to give you an idea of why knowing who is asking a question puts it into context. So what interpreters do is typically they'll sign from the direction. That person asks a question, and often if they can fit it in or if they see the deaf consumer looking, they will say, oh, the girl in the back or the, the guy with the hat, and then keep interpreting. So, so that the consumer gets context because again remember they're in the front and they're missing who who's what's happening behind them so that was something that that took place and it's another reason why again I have reminded everyone throughout the course but some people have been very slow to pick up is why I want you to consider the way you record your videos the way you dress for your videos, the way you set up your lighting, the way you set up your picture frame, your camera frame, everything in view. This is a visual language. And remember, one of the questions that we had in a previous lecture was, how can you show in, in this culture that places such importance on all things visual, how is it that you show respect? And you show it by solid top and in this environment consideration of your lighting consideration of your background and consideration of your camera angle now of course I don't expect you to have a fancy background but what can you control you can control your attire and you can control your lighting you can control if you're slouching or if you've got interpreter posture now, I understand, I don't expect everyone to have fancy interpreter business casual clothes already, but what's the simplest thing you can do? You can probably turn a black t-shirt inside out so that you don't show a logo. I notice those things, and of course I take those into consideration because I can tell when you're putting an effort. And that's all that I have asked from the beginning of this class is to put the effort participate in the profession in which that you want to be a part of. So it means take these things seriously and into consideration because this is how your peers, your future colleagues, your future employer will judge you. They will judge you on do you know the standards of the profession? And it's something that I have tried to get you accustomed to uh, accustomed to doing um, in in your videos and so we kind of took a little bit of a sidebar there for me to do a little bit of uh, reminder uh, it's the reason is because it's it's not an Arlene thing it's not that I'm being so strict or so picky it's an expectation of the profession and so I would not be doing my job if I didn't then place this expectation on you to get it figured out now. And so back to, back to the PowerPoint. Um, it was during this period, we're now on the fourth bullet. During this period that the interpreters adopted the use of solid colored smocks or a color contrasting to their skin tone. And so that's really key. Do we all have to wear black? No. If it's contrasting to your skin tone and to your background, wear black. For example, sometimes in this location I'm at, it can get pretty dark. And I actually will change my top to like a lighter color top to contrast with my skin and with my background, etc. Uh, we still see interpreters use smocks in the video relay setting because uh, in serving the deafblind community, uh, sometimes they will ask for a more a darker background or a more solid um, top. Maybe, maybe um, they need more darkness to be able to, um, I'm losing my thoughts, more 
more darkness to be able to contrast with the skin so that they can then see. And a lot of video relay providers have the ability just like, hold on, pull over that screen. Let me get the smock on. Re let me get closer. Remember things like Usher syndrome. We need to sign a little bit closer. There's a, a smaller line of sight, etc. And so that still happens. Interpreters still wear smocks, but just not out in the field. Um, and then lastly, the last bullet that says, in addition to excluding other visual features that might hamper communication, your book mentioned that interpreters change their mustache or change their facial um, hair. Um, I've seen, um, I still see it, interpreters wearing crazy earrings, and that's not the standard. Um, usually the interpreters that I've seen do that get less and less work because here's something else to consider. Employers and hiring entities won't always tell you why they won't hire you again or why they won't make you another offer. Because a lot of interpreting work is piecemeal, meaning it's very hard to get a full-time job somewhere, but it's there's an abundance of work to work a little bit everywhere. You can work a lot. You can work 24 hours. There's 24 hours a day type of work, things happening overnight, things happening on the weekend. There's a lot of work, but it tends to be piecemeal. And we'll talk about uh, the type of work that there is a little later in the class. But because work is that way, someone may offer you an assignment and you show up not in interpreter attire or, or not in consideration of other visual features, and they will just simply not ask you to come back. But you'll never know. You'll be like, oh, I guess there's no work. And then later you'll hear from somebody else like, wow, I get a lot of work from this place. And you're like, wait a minute. How come they don't ask me? You will not know. And so it's much better to get a handle on it now and just know the standards of the profession and what is expected of you because then you know it's not that. <laughs> and then the other thing that that um, informs an employer, but also informs a deaf client, is that you're a professional and you take this seriously. And when you're a professional and you take this seriously, a deaf consumer may have more confidence in you. And so does the entity, the hiring entity, which is half the battle. Have confidence in me because I'm going to need someone to repeat something. I'm going to get something wrong. But because I'm a professional, I'm going to be open about it. And I'm going to be professional about it. And then so when they view you as a professional, then they're more willing to say, hey, I have this other job for you. But you know what? Those earrings you wore were kind of distracting. Can you not wear those? Absolutely, I'm so sorry, I never thought of that. And so that's the way it works. So I just gave you all a little bit of a uh, tough love moment while talking about the communication philosophy, uh, the communication facilitation philosophy, uh, but it was a moment we had to have because my goal is for you to be working interpreters. And you cannot be a working interpreter if people aren't asking you to come back. So you have to have all these things in your consideration at all times while you're working. Okay, on to the next slide. So with the communication facilitation philosophy, according to the author, the interpreters following this philosophy, they were more focused on the visual and logistic, logistic aspects of interpreting but not considering equitable access. So what the author is saying is that they got the lighting down, the clothing down, the setup down, basically that. The setup was set. They were all about the setup, but not considering 
those other factors that we have talked about, which is social justice, oppression, truly equitable access, and the power that an interpreter holds in being the one that holds information from, again, both parties. And by that I mean the cultural and linguistic information and the ability to go back and forth. And so then we arrive to the bilingual, bicultural model, the bi-bi model. And this bilingual, bicultural is only talking about hearing deaf and that. It is not taking into consideration the other cultural components of the hearing person may be from a different country or the deaf person may be from a different country. It's not taking into consideration those other cultures, but strictly speaking, deaf culture, hearing culture. And so this philosophy emerged in an effort to find that middle ground between the helper and the machine model that were the two extremes. And so in this model, interpreters are sensitive to physical communication dynamics. Again, keeping the visual uh, parts of communication, who's speaking and placing themselves appropriately, considering those logistics that the communication facilitation model considered. But also, now they've added understanding the inherent difference in languages, in cultures, in norms of social interaction, in the schema, and considering the whole picture in the interpretation process. And so this is where we are today. We know that an effective interpretation requires cultural and linguistic mediation while also accomplishing the speaker's goals and maintaining dynamic equivalence. We know this because we started the semester understanding how culture affects communication and how it affects language choices, expressions, and we know that you cannot separate one from the other. In order to understand language, you must understand culture. And so in this model, we know that it requires the use of cultural expansions and reductions. So you'll see this sign a lot. That's an expansion. And a reduction means, there's, I don't really have a sign for a reduction in, uh, in the interpreting process, but it's basically when we drop information intentionally. Like you've given me way too much unnecessary detail, and if I give this person all that detail, we're gonna lose them. Let me, let me make sure your point gets across and drop unnecessary information. But it's very key to understand that this isn't something that just happens because you just decide to, it actually happens with intention. And our initial research indicates that when interpreters properly mediate languages, which means properly use expansion, properly use reductions, the deaf individual receiving the interpreted information they're able to demonstrate a significantly higher level of comprehension of the information. And so what research tells us is that it works. This definitely is a more effective approach to interpreting. And so remember, what does the bye bye model consider in accomplishing the speaker goal? We have to know what is the goal of communication. What is the setting? Is the goal to teach, to inspire, to entertain, to counsel, to impress? Meaning, example, is this a job interview and someone's trying to impress a potential future employer? All of this might affect the interpreter's word choices, 
the interpreter's tone and delivery. And remember, we have said this before, we, we have learned this. Language is powerful, and your word choices have the power to accomplish all of those goals. And so the bye-bye philosophy, the bye-bye model, in this model, the interpreter recognizes that these goals are accomplished differently in each language and in each culture. And so it's not just a passing of information. It's a navigating culture and language, culture and language, because remember, the interpreter is the one who holds the information for both. And so we keep talking about maintaining dynamic equivalence. And the dynamics refers to the way people in any interaction react or how they engage with the speaker or the signer of any given message. And so the bye-bye interpreter, their goal is to interpret the message to those involved uh, receiving the interpreted communication so that their response is as dynamic as if they didn't need the interpreter. So we want them to have the same effect, the same reaction. Um, I mean, and, and don't think, oh, everyone's gonna react in the same way to this joke. That's not what I mean. What I mean is they have this, the same impact and so they have the same ability to react to the information as anyone else, given that they have received it through the interpreted version. And so with the bye-bye model, in reference to cultural and linguistic mediation, in this model, the interpreter conveys both explicitly stated ideas and information conveyed implicitly. Remember, earlier in the semester, we talked about high context communication and low context communication. Low context communication is staying it, stating things explicitly and clearly. High context communication is conveyed in tone, in facial expression, in, in other ways, even in actions, and this is from a hearing person in their use of spoken language. And many times, as we talked about also in the English language, we receive most of the meaning, not from the words directly, but by the delivery. Remember that we said it's not what you say, but how you say it. And so it's because we're deriving meaning from, from the overall picture that our interpretation includes not just the words. Remember in the machine model, they're just throwing words out there. But I'm giving you meaning now. I'm putting things into context for the consumer. I'm conveying information. And the same is true for, for a voice interpretation. I'm not just throwing words words at you. I'm giving you meaning. I'm conveying the information and putting it into context for the hearing person as well. And so this requires that linguistic and cultural mediation, which is what we call linguistic expansion. Linguistic expansion is interpreting that in implicit information or ideas as well as the explicit information. So it's the example that we just said that guarantees full communication. Then cultural expansion. And that is providing contextual information needed to make sense, which um, a very basic example is when we expand uh, uh, 
very uh, death experience type signs uh, in English. For example, this sign, we do not offer a voice interpretation that says uh, institute. This does not mean institute unless it literally means institute. This means a school for the deaf. And so that is an expansion into a voiced interpretation. So likewise, we can expand in either direction. And then there's also the cultural or linguistic reduction that I also call dropping information. And this is sometimes reducing that amount of detail of information, remember, without affecting the intended meaning or goal, sometimes that is necessary in order for understanding to take place. As a vocultural and linguistic mediation, I have to stress that linguistic and cultural adaptations changes in the information or in the interpretation, they're not made on a whim. Interpreters don't just do it for the sake of an easier job. It's something that's considered uh, very carefully. And it usually is based on one of three reasons. So the first reason is, is there a linguistic need to do this? Is there a cultural need to do this? And is there a difference in experiential frame to do this? What does that mean? Is there a linguistic need? For example, ASL rarely uses passive voice. So the interpreter typically changes a sentence from passive voice to active voice. The example of passive voice is the door was closed. Who closed the door? Why did we say the door was closed? Why do we have to say it in those words? But active voice is changing the sentence to indicate maybe the just a closed door or he closed the door or she closed the door. Of course understanding if he or she has come up in prior parts of that information. That's just a very basic example. But passive voice is actually very difficult to interpret um, without changing it to active voice. Is there a cultural need? So remember, and we know this already, we're ahead. Language reflects cultural norms. For example, in English, it involves the frequent use of the addressee's name in a one-on-one -on -one small group interaction. Sometimes in English, saying someone's name is a way of, it may be a way of getting their attention, but it's also sometimes a way of softening a blow. Example, Arlene, those earrings are kind of distracting. So the name is said to kind of prepare the person to soften the criticism I'm about to deliver. Very different from those earrings are really distracting, right? It's, it's kind of got a little bit of a um, walking on eggshells moment before I deliver the, the criticism. But in ASL, a frequent use of a person's name can lead to misunderstandings. And so in this situation, the interpreter might just drop that, might throw it in once or twice, but it's unnecessary um, in this situation. And so for a cultural reason, that is dropped. So what do we mean by difference in experiential frame? Sometimes it's necessary to provide specific information so that the recipient of the information can have a schema in order to understand information conveyed. And so expansions or reductions of source language are considered, but again, not taken lightly. And this is, I can point you again to those information, the, I'm sorry, the idea of 
the deaf experience, um, expansion on that kind of information, but also maybe uh, telephone etiquette. Maybe the conversation is about things happening on the phone and, and uh, more information is needed because using a video phone is very different than using a telephone. And so for the bilingual bicultural philosophy in action, answer the following. Can you think of an example in which a linguistic and cultural adaptation may be necessary? And if you do give an example, not if you do, but when you do, identify if it's a linguistic, cultural, or difference in experiential frame that is the reason for that type of adaptation. Just see if you can think of one. And it might be the, the reason or the need for it might be all three of them. Just see what you can come up with. So now we're going to talk about how this influences our ethical decision making. How does a, our philosophy influence the way we operate? So as your book indicates, the way an interpreter operating under the bilingual bicultural model interprets and applies the code of conduct is different because this interpreter is taking into consideration the reality that we are human and so are the two other people. I mean, it could be many, but in my example, the two other people in this situation. And there is power that I hold just by nature of the fact that I am the interpreter. I am trained in understanding both cultures and both linguistic needs. And I have power in that. So now, if we go back to the RID CPC, and you should already have these. These were introduced in a previous chapter. But if we look at the tenets and we think about the bi -bi bilingual bicultural philosophy and model of interpreting, we can see how the interpreter is taking these tenets and using them as again as a guide not as a strict set of rules um, to follow in the machine uh, conduit model as that way but but as a guide and uh, I don't think that you can see the the color change in text that I tried to do on the tenets but I changed the color for number two number three and number four because very specifically although as an interpreter we're following all tenets in everything that we do and in in every way that we practice from beginning to end um, in offering services the bye-bye uh, philosophy and model specifically ties into those three so the interpreter must possess the professional skills and knowledge required for the specific interpreting situation. That's a given in consideration of accepting an assignment. The ability to expand or to drop or reduce information is a skill. You're not just doing it on a whim. You're not just doing it because it's easier. You're doing it because the situation requires it because the cultural situation or the linguistic needs require it. But an interpreter has to have skill to be able to do that in an appropriate and efficient yet successful way. So the interpreter doesn't expand everything. The interpreter expands information as it becomes necessary and as it applies to the given situation. And so the interpreter has to possess the ability, the capability, and the skill to be able to know when something requires expansion or reduction and to do it in an effective way. And number three, the interpreter conduct themselves in a manner that's appropriate. The interpreter understands the cultural implications of not behaving accordingly to the behaviors, uh, the given set of norm social interaction behaviors in any given culture. And so 
the interpreter being able to understand this and abide by it is part of the CPC and is part of them doing their job. And number four, the interpreter demonstrating respect for the consumer. An interpreter identifying that information requires expansion or reduction and delivering the message in that way because they understand the cultural and linguistic needs of the client is showing their respect for the consumer by delivering the appropriate service. It's something very important to consider of how the CPC is viewed in doing the job. And so again, to touch, continue on the point of the influence on the ethical decision making, we have to remember that the client being served is really the one who takes the lead. Does every client require an expansion or reduction in linguistic information? No. Does every client require the interpreter to become a fountain of information or a resource or to culturally mediate? No. Many times the deaf person wants to be the one who educates. The deaf person wants to be the one that says, that speaks about the deaf experience in their communication. And so it's the interpreter's job to interpret their information rather than to have it for expansion, etc. And so really we have to follow the lead. Let the consumer take the lead. Let the consumer guide the interpreter as to what kind of service they are uh, requiring in any given situation and what fits best for them. So we were not we will not always be the same version of an interpreter in every situation. Every situation calls for a different need and uh, for different uh, a different way that we approach things. And so here's number four. Read the bilingual bicultural philosophy in action and answer the following. So after you read the scenario, what did the interpreter in this scenario do differently that now stands out to you? Now that we have discussed a bilingual bicultural philosophy in action, what did they do differently that stands out? And how has the interpreter applied the CPC to the situation? And so this chapter brings us to this, to this thought that we all have to have as interpreters. You have to remember your reason for becoming an interpreter and your reason will guide you. For example, the reason of removing a language barrier, the reason of serving a community that has been historically oppressed, the reason of being a professional communicator and wanting to provide access. If I know that these are my reasons, then those reasons will help guide me using the CPC in order to make effective decisions, effective and ethical decisions that are still following my own values as an interpreter, following an interpreter model that's a standard in the profession, but also following the code of professional conduct. And so those seven tenets, they're so simple to read, but they're actually very complex to apply and to follow in every given situation. And so I always uh, have to ask myself, what is gonna help me sleep better at night? F help me feel like I did the right thing and that I followed my own values and my own moral compass in applying the CPC. Uh, because believe it or not, not all interpreters may respond in the same way as, as you would to any given situation. Um, every situation is very, very unique. And so if you are very centered, if you know your values, and you know your reason for becoming an interpreter, this will really guide you on following the interpreter philosophy model, 
again and applying the CPC. You really, really have to have a strong sense of who you are as a professional and what the goal of the job is. Example is if I'm a college interpreter, I know that the goal of my job is the lecture and it's not my job to teach but it's my job to transmit the information that the professor is is uh, offering in the same way to to give that same impactful um, way of teaching and then it's different if the situation is uh, if for example we took we look at the uh, press briefings what is the goal of the press briefings is to alert people to what's going on in the world. It's to alert people of new changes, of safety measures, of um, anything that might be changing in terms of what's opening, what's reopening, what's shutting down, etc. And so it's it's a very different goal if you take those two. One is to teach, to pass on this information, and one is to alert and to inform in a very different way. And so if you look at the delivery of the interpreter, you may, be, you may see that it's delivered in a very different way. And the interpreter is using uh, the understanding of their goal and the understanding of, again, having respect for the consumer and using expansion or reduction techniques in order to deliver the message. And so I just wanna remind you that we have already talked about leadership. We've talked about the why to the why that you're here. We've talked about now um, interpreting models and approach. And so all these pieces you should be able to bring together to understand and have a strong sense of again why you're here and that will always center your decision making if you understand hey my reason for being here is to provide access so i'm going to do it so one example of uh, that's in your book is the interpreter is asked to leave the room and the interpreter does not why does the interpreter not leave the room probably because their why is to provide access. And how can I provide access if I step out? That's just one example of how understanding and having a strong sense of who you are as a professional will guide you in your decision making. So I believe this is actually the last slide. Let's see. So that's the end of today's lecture for chapter eight, and you will see the questions uh, posted on Canvas. Thanks.